We're fortunate tonight to have Dr. Scott Pearson of the Department of Fish and Wildlife with us. He's been studying streaked horned larks in the Puget Lowlands for the past six years. We'd like to hear his story. Well, horned larks are found throughout uh, the world, and in North America we have 21 subspecies of horned lark. And the subspecies I've been studying is one of those 21 subspecies. We have three subspecies of horned lark breeding in Washington. There's the streaked horned lark, which is found in the Puget Lowlands and on the coast of Washington and on the lower Columbia River. There's the alpine horned lark, which is found up in the alpine habitats. And then there's the third subspecies, which is found in eastern Washington. Now, we, I had one initial question I had is, was the streaked horned lark genetically distinct? and evolving independently. And that was one of the first questions we sought to answer. And we found out it, it actually is independent. It, it actually evolved from the California coastal birds and not the other birds, the horn larks that we see here and other subspecies of horn larks we see here in Washington. And it appears to be uh, evolving independently and has been for some time. Uh, it's much smaller than every other subspecies, and it's also much brighter in color than every other subspecies. It has much more yellow and a lot brighter reds on the back. The other two do not have any special legal status. Only the street horn lark does, and it is considered a federal candidate for listing underneath the Endangered Species Act, the federal act, um, which indicates there's enough information to suggest that it could be listed underneath that act. It's listed as endangered in Washington, um, underneath our state's Endangered Species Act. And then in British Columbia, it's actually listed as endangered and also has another listing, which means extirpated. It means it's no longer found there. It used mm -hmm. to be, but is no longer there. Historically, it bred in southern British Columbia all the way down to the Rogue River Valley. And over time, that range has contracted both in the north and the south. So now it's only found in southern Puget Sound, not north of here. And then it's only found really from the Eugene Corvallis area north, where it used to be found all the way down to the Rogue River Valley. What types of habitats do the streaked horn larks prefer? Well, they prefer areas that are treeless and shrubless and that are dominated by grasses and forbs and need to be fairly large in size. And so you find it on native uh, Puget prairies. You find it on actually dredge spoil islands. You find it on beaches along the Washington coast. And you also find it on airports which are treeless and shrubless and very large. Were the birds historically found on airports? No. <laughs> but all of the airports that it is found on used to be Puget Prairies. And um, people put the airports there probably because it was flat and open. So McCord Air Force Base was put on a prairie. Gray Army Airfield was. Shelton Airport was. And so was Olympia Airport, actually. Olympia Airport used to be known as Bush, Bush's Prairie. Could you tell us about your research and how you go about determining the needs of a streaked horned lark? Well, the first question I want to know, was it a good subspecies and did it warrant our conservation attention? And so that was the first question I answered and it, it, it appears that it's, yes, it's unique and it uh, appears to have actually almost no genetic diversity, suggesting that it's in trouble, suggesting that inbreeding's going on. Uh, the second question I sought uh, to answer was, what are the habitat needs of the species? And what I, the way I did that is I looked at areas that it was using and compared to areas that it wasn't using in the same area. And I found out it's really selecting very sparsely vegetated areas for breeding. Uh, females, interestingly, select a, they're the ones who select the nest site and build the nest. And they appear to select sites on the, always on the north side of a plant. And that's often a forb, often a lupin, but it also could be a bunch grass and it'll always be on that north side. If you think about being on the north side of a plant, as the sun is moving across the horizon from east to west, uh, it's always to the south, and that plant is always providing some shade to that nest. One of the primary threats to reproductive success, successful reproduction, is uh, predation. And we, it's been difficult for us to capture predators in the, in the act of, of eating their eggs or chicks. We have opportunistically watched a couple of different predators. We've seen a garter snake, a garter snake, eating the young on, on prairie. We've seen two crows eating either young or eggs. And then we actually watched northern harrier eat eggs on the coast, um, interestingly. So we, we just happened to capture those. And it's hard to know about the signific significance of those. You know, are those the important predators? Could it be actually a small mammal? 
And so one thing this year we wanted to know we put, was, well, can we answer that question? Who are the primary predators? So we put out cameras on nests, and then we rotated those cameras around. We actually had three digital cameras, and they take images, uh, digital images, 24 hours a day. So they're taking them at night and also during the day. And then we can look at those images later and try to determine who the predator was if that nest happens to be um, eaten by predators. Well, we had, unfortunately, some, well, fortunately for the lark, but unfortunately for us, very few of the nests where we placed cameras um, had predators. But the few that we did document were actually eaten, the eggs were eaten by western meadowlarks, which was a real surprise. We, we, if you look in the literature, you see that there's evidence that western meadowlarks are predators of other grass and birds. But I hadn't really suspected them. And the, it occurred on the same prairie, but the, the two nests were very far apart. And so they would have been in different meadowlark territories, indicating this probably was two different western meadowlarks that uh, ate the eggs on both of these nests. And then also the pattern of, of depredation, so a pattern of how the event occurred is consistent with what we've seen at other nests, where one egg will disappear one day, or one or two eggs, and then several days will pass before another egg will, will be eaten. And that's what we captured on film with the western meadowlarks. They came in, ate an egg, and then waited a few days and then came back and ate another egg. So here's a native species found on the same grasslands that's eating eggs of the horn lark. And that to me was interesting, and, but I also think there's some lessons for management from this. Uh, as, these, as these prairies become vegetated by non-native grasses, they become quite dense. And meadowlarks do very well in that. Also, meadowlarks like small shrubs for purchase for singing off of. And so we're losing the sparsely vegetated areas that horn larks prefer, but we seem to be having an increase in the amount of habitat that the western meadowlark prefers. And so if we could create core areas that are very, very sparsely vegetated, I would suspect that meadowlarks wouldn't use those as well, as much as they do now. Uh, that might move them to the periphery. It's anything that changes that habitat from being sparsely vegetated to being densely vegetated is a problem. Uh, one question we wanted to figure out is, is fire a good thing for larks? Because all of our Puget Prairies evolved with fire, or actually really human-caused uh, fire. Um, so Native Americans were burning Puget Prairies for probably thousands of years. And they're probably burning them every few years. And the reason we think those were burned was primarily for the food crops that, that those prairies provided, and that includes camas, includes a variety of other things um, that they ate as well. Over time, as those fires have been suppressed and we've developed the landscape, so we developed lands where they used to be, um, we're now seeing shrubs and trees encroaching. And we're seeing, particularly right now, a lot of non-native plants coming in. So we're seeing non-native pasture grasses that were introduced in people's yards, but also originally introduced for, for cattle. Uh, and then we're also seeing uh, scotch broom and other, uh, other non-native shrubs coming in and taking over the habitat. And when it becomes dens densely vegetated, uh, the lark won't use it anymore. If you think about a lark, a lark walks on the ground. Some birds hop and some walk. This is a walker. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be able to walk through its environment. And it's walking through its environment to find seeds and insects. And as it becomes denser, uh, it's very hard for the, a lark to move through that environment. And in general, you just find they move away from those environments. Because of the inbreeding issue, we're having low hatchability of eggs. So a lot of eggs appear to be inviable. So they can be inviable for two reasons. One is it could be some sort of toxin in the environment, or two, it could be because they're infertile. And we don't know the answer to that question, and that would be one question I'd like to answer. If we find that they are infertile, it could be as a result of inbreeding. So we're having close relatives breeding together. And they have very high site fidelity, which means they return to the same site to breed every year. So if you return to the same site, there's a good chance you'll start to breed with, and there are very few of you, there's a good chance you'll start to breed with your close relatives. And there are documented cases of mothers breeding with sons. And so when you have that going on, that can create some, some issues in terms of the viability of eggs. Um, so that's one issue. So how could we address that? And one way of addressing that could be to start mixing things up. So we could start to move eggs, perhaps. A Willamette Valley egg up here, um, if it's at the sta same stage, and let the bird up here incubate it and, and raise it. 
and then hopefully that young will return here uh, to breed. There are a variety of other ways we could think about trying to address that issue. So that would be one, one thing we could do. Two, we could think about ways of controlling these non-native and invasive plants. Uh, we could reintroduce fire, we could use herbicides, we can try mowing. There are a variety of different techniques we can use to control non-native and invasive plants. And so we need to think about all those tools and how can we use them to create the ideal conditions, the sparsely vegetated habitat that they depend on. So what would you say is the prognosis for the horned lark in the next 20 years? Well, our, all of our analyses suggest that lambda is less than one. And what lambda means is that it's a declining, you have to have a lambda of one or greater to have an increasing population. All of our modeling suggests that actually it's decreasing over time. So it looks bad. Uh, we probably have fewer than 800 birds left in the world. So it's probably one of our rare subspecies uh, out there. And so it, it doesn't look good at the moment. And so unless we do something quickly, I don't think it stands a whole lot of chance of surviving in the future. Uh, but I think there are things we can do, and there are things that people are doing to try to change that. And, and hopefully we'll, we will make some efforts to, to turn that tide and, and go in a different direction. We also have some active management going on by Fort Lewis and by the Nature Conservancy to try to, to control non-native species. And so hopefully that'll start to make a difference. And also I think we need to start thinking about the winter habitat. As we found that it's adult survivorship, which is most important to an increasing population. So if we don't get adult survivorship up, the population won't increase. And one, usually one of the seasons that's most important to adult survivorship is the overwintering. Um, season where there's a lot of stress, very few food resources, and it would be nice to know, we're, well, we have an idea of some of the locations where they're going to winter, but are those good habitats and is there a way to make those better?